All right, one thing I want to talk about to start um, is a discussion we had towards the end of class last time, and that was on the notion of aliasing and anti-aliasing. Um, and you, you see this dealing with images, so this is going back a, a little bit, but you also see it uh, with regards to typography and alias and anti-alias. And when I was talking, when I was conversing, I got things a little backwards. What I was calling aliasing actually is anti-aliasing or fixing aliasing. In a nutshell, here's what it is. Keep in mind that essentially everything we see on a computer screen is like a mosaic of little dots. And I'm drawing them like a grid, but they're really like little dots. And if we look at this, If we were to draw, for example, the letter A, let's say, actually would see a little staircase there if we look closely. All right? Now, what can we do to fix that? Well, we can't really fix that, but we can kind of trick the eye into seeing, instead of seeing jagged edges, into seeing a more smooth line. Keep in mind that this is very much exaggerated, all right? That in reality, you know, a letter would be a whole bunch of different pixels like this. What we can do to achieve an illusion of a straight line is to Maybe not make this all the way red, but maybe make some of these things more of a pink. Or if this were black and white, like I always got to remember to bring a black marker to class. But if we were talking about a black and white thing, that would be like a shade of gray. All right? And that sort of tricks the eye into seeing it as a smooth line as opposed to a... Um, um, a, a, a jagged staircase. Same is true as far as curves as well. Letters that are curves, you know, an O would look, you know, jagged. You know, it would look like a set of staircases, you know, going around. But if they fill in some of these other pixels with a lighter color of it, it'll look more like a continuous thing. And that's what anti-aliasing is. Now, anti-aliasing is anything that's done to fix that kind of problem, all right? You have it in typography. You know, you have it with your letters, anti-aliasing. You also have it with images. And the one example that we showed in class was a GIF where we looked very closely at, at uh, um, a, a, a gradient, and we noticed that the colors didn't smoothly transition but there were like other colors sort of mixed in between. So let's look at a couple examples of these before we continue on and, uh, and looking at audio. So first thing we're going to do is we're going to look at how anti-aliasing was done in a GIF file. And I think I had that, if we look under images. These gradients.
we notice here, that looks like a continuous shading from dark to light. If we, however, look real, real close at this and get it expanded to its maximum size and go down here, all right, notice that that light blue is actually a mix of a light blue, a kind of a purplish almost, and a green, all right, but well, we're seeing this, you know, magnified many, many, many times. If we go back to a normal size for this, If we go back to a normal size of that, you don't see the checkerboarding effect because it's so close together. So that just looks like a light shade of blue, when in reality it's like three colors blended together. GIFs do that to represent colors that um, are not going to be stored. Remember, the, one of the ways that the GIFs uh, achieve compression is by limiting the number of colors. All right. Well, by limiting the number of colors, it tries to show you some of the colors that it's not going to store, doing that by tricking you and putting two colors next to each other. So that is an example of anti-aliasing. Another example of that, as far as typography, um, let's look at our friend Wikipedia. What is the rule for using Wikipedia? Here, I never heard the rule for Wikipedia put better than this. It's okay if Wikipedia is the first source that you look at, but it shouldn't be the last. All right, so, you know, if there's a topic that I don't know anything about, and I just want a quick summary to just sort of like, oh, okay, that's what that is. Maybe I knew it by another term or whatever. A lot of times I'll look at Wikipedia. If I really want to study something in depth, though, I might use that as a start and go and continue. The other, the other rule, I guess I would say, about Wikipedia is a typical rule. You know, the more extreme or controversial the topic, the more grains of salt that you need to to, to take it with. We saw that on last time. So. Was the this one? All right. No. Yeah, maybe not. What are you looking for a sample? I'm looking for a sample. You know what? It was under aliasing. There we go. All right. And this I'm also going to expand. Maybe. There we go. Here's an example of this letter being aliased. In other words, we know if we were drawing this on the board, it would have a smooth line. But because data is represented as pixels, it's jagged. Now, how noticeable is that? Well, it depends on like what size you make it. Here, I'm obviously making it a lot bigger than normal to, to, to exaggerate the effect. <coughs> Anti-aliasing, and if you notice here, there's different shades of gray filling that in. And again, at this highly mag uh, magnified view, we can see it. But if we re re uh, reduce this down to a normal view, let's say right there, I can still tell, I don't know on the screen, but I can still tell sitting here that that's jaggedy, whereas this looks like a smooth line, even though it really isn't. 
So that's what anti-aliasing is. All right, we had a discussion towards the end of class, and, and a couple people asked questions and had questions, and so I thought it would be a good idea to, to, to touch on that. Yes? So then in things like graphics design and animation, uh -huh. um, aren't those supposed to be vectors? Usually? Yes. So why would they need, have the need for an anti-aliasing filter? Because. The vector doesn't scale. Are there any other questions? No. Uh, <laughs> because still, when push comes to shove, it's going to be rendered on a screen worth of pixels. So in other words, look at it this way. If we have a tiny circle that's stored as a bitmap, if we, and, that, that's stored as a bitmap, and we expand it, that tiny circle is going to look really jaggedy, all right, where it will be visible for, for the naked eye as being, uh, you know, uh, pixelated, all right. If we have a vector image of a tiny circle, that tiny circle is still a bunch of pixels that are jaggedy. If we make it bigger, it produces a bigger thing, but there's still a little bit of jaggediness to it, right, because no matter what, when push comes to shove, it has to be displayed through a set of pixels. So it will look better, it will look less aliased than a bitmapped image, but it won't be completely not aliased. So to get the very realistic graphics, it would go and anti-alias that. I will say things like 3D animation, and that, that isn't necessarily my forte, but I'm pretty confident that, that that would be the answer to your question. All right, audio. We have a little setup here that um, I have these for you to use. I, I believe they're over in the lab. You can even borrow one to take it home if you want. There is a note in there that says that something in here contains lead. So they suggest that you wash your hands after you use this. So I'm just passing the warning along. I, I, don't, I don't know. All right, let's take a look at what we have here. All right, we have a microphone. There's different sorts of microphones uh, based on whether they pick up like sound from all around or whether they pick up sound just like in front of them, all right, the direction of a microphone. This one, I believe, pretty much picks more in front and, and anything behind is not going to pick up quite as well. I'm pretty sure that's this kind of mic, all right. It does pay to have better equipment especially audio equipment. You know, better mic will sound a lot better than if you use just the mic that is, is in, your, uh, in your computer, uh, which I found out the hard way after recording a video for one of my online classes today where the audio was, apparent, was, was I, I could, couldn't even hear it. It was very scratched. I don't know if there's like potato chips in my microphone or what, but I, I couldn't hear anything from it. All right, this microphone plugs into this little box and this box plugs into the USB port, all right? So what does this box have? Well, it has stereo versus mono. It has the level of the mic, and we'll see how that's important. You can adjust that to accommodate between someone who's speaking softly and someone who's speaking loudly. If you have the level too high and someone is speaking loudly, um, there'll be, like, distortions in it. You know, um, and it won't sound good. If you have it too low, then you might not be able to hear the person or hear them at all. This is the strength that is going to output the signal to there. So this is sort of the strength that is going to output the signal to our recording software. This is a little mixer that mixes the playback and the audio being recorded. For example, Later on in class, when I do the entire Hallelujah Chorus a cappella and sing all four parts of it, no, I'm just kidding, I'm not going to do that. But if I were going to, for example, record over myself, if I were going to sing a duet with myself, all right, I would need to hear like the first part to sing the second part. So you can choose between what you want to hear more or less. Do I want to hear what I'm saying right now, or do I want to focus on what's being played back? So when you do multiple track recording, again, that allows you to mix between the two. Did that control what's coming out the speakers? Mm -hmm. The mic. It, 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 it's the blend of what comes out of the speakers and the mic. All right? To hear that, though, you need the headphones on. 
You need the headphones attached to this. Oh, attached to that. Attached to this, the not the okay. computer. Right. Yeah, that's a good point. And we're coming to this. <clears throat> Keep in mind that as I'm showing you this, um, I'm going to demonstrate some things that's going to require me to have it coming out of the speaker. But if I were actually doing like multi-tracking, I'd put the, the headphones on and have it come out of there. So when I get to that part of the example, I'll put the headphones on. Probably won't do you any good. You won't be able to hear it, but at least I'll demonstrate the, the setup and, and, and that kind of thing. All right. This is stereo versus mono. You can click on. And I think that's about it. When in doubt, play around with it. I mean, that's always my... Uh, that's always my uh, um, philosophy as far as this. It's actually a place where you can plug in your uh, guitar or other instrument if you want to. All right. Now let's fire up Audacity and let's just make a very simple recording. One of the things I want to demonstrate is the files that you get when you use Audacity. All right. And this is consistent with a lot of multimedia tools. Uh, Remember when we talked about the GIMP? The GIMP, we say files as XCF files. That was our um, working file. That was the file that we're developing on, that we're making our changes to. When we're done, we export it into a common format. Because not everyone can handle XCF files. You know, if you put those out on the web, people won't be able to view them because browsers can't handle them. Unless you happen to have the GIMP, you will not be able to view them. For Photoshop, the equivalent of that is, is a PSD file. Now, when we get into um, videos and audio, it's done a little bit differently, but the same idea holds. There's going to be a format that's, that's native to Audacity that we're going to save our files in, and then we're going to export it to a common format. Like AUP. Exactly. It's an AUP file. But even then, the AUP file is the project, but it also stores the separate audio files in a different folder. Yeah. Uh, video does the same thing, by the way. Most video tools do the same thing. There's sort of like a, a file that ties everything together, and then individual clips are stored there. So let's fire up Audacity. Here we go. You still have to download the codec for, uh, to make MP3? I believe you do. We'll, we'll, get to that. we'll get to that in a second. All right. How do I record? Well, here's the record button. First thing we want to do is we want to test to make sure our mic is, is working. And I could just click record and do that. That's how I usually test it. Probably the better way to do that is through my control panel. If I look, I can go and test this. I have it enabled to use this. I want to test the levels for it. How would I do Isn't that? that with those bars on the right there? Mm -hmm. Bars on the right. Oh, yeah. Duh. Right. So there I'm going. I'm tapping it. Yeah, it's connected. Keep in mind, the, you know, the mic can come from any number of sources. You could potentially have many sources, like many laptops have an internal mic and then have this if you plug it in. All right. So notice that it's not catching me as I'm speaking, but it is catching me when I tap, um, which means I might want to up the, um, the, imp the, 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 the mic input. So what I did is I just turned that up, so now it's hearing me. When I turn it down, it's not hearing me. Notice when I tap on it, turn down, it barely registers, or if I turn it up and tap on it, it goes all the way to the top. So what you want is you want a nice sort of even level, all right, based on what you're recording and based on the speaker. All right, I'll move it a little bit closer uh, to get an idea. You can also go and, um, let's see. Let's see, does that, all right, that did not make an impact. All right, there we go. So you want it sort of in the middle. If it's constantly hitting the top, you run the risk of distortion, all right, so you'd want to pull it down a little bit. The other thing that we're going to look at is for the playback. And I'm going to start off with the playback being on the speakers. I'm going to make those the default. All right. 
That way, when I record, we'll be able to hear it immediately. If I was actually doing this and I was multi-tracking me, I would make the um, I'd make the playback to be this device again, like I did with the microphone. That way, I could hear through the headphones this. I will have, by the way, for you speakers and microphones and stuff in the lab. Uh, or, of course, as you're working on these things, you can bring your own headphones if you have them. I know a lot of people probably already have their own headphones. All right. So, we go and we hit the record. And I go and talk. I can see based on the level where I'm at. All right? I can move the level down, which now notice it's barely moving. Or I can move it up, in which case it's butting against the top quite a bit. So you can, uh, you can do that through Audacity too. That like mic up there with the arrow. Oh, okay. Like that you can uh, usually like input the uh, change the input levels how high you want it. Oh, okay. Excellent. You see that, like the left. Yeah. Input. Click the. Mm -hmm. All right. So. When we're all done and record it, we can stop it, and there's our one track. Tracks in audio are much like uh, layers in, um, in images, and, and layers in movies, and even layers in animation, all right? In that, that they kind of overlay on top of each other. So now I'm going to play this back. And I go and talk. I can see based on the level where I'm at. All right? I can move the level. All right, there I was moving the level down. Or I can move it up, in which case it's butting against the top quite a bit. All right, there I'm moving it down and up again. So you get the idea. If I was going to record myself talking to myself, thankfully it hasn't quite come to that for me yet in my life, but you never know. You never know. What I would do is I would switch the audio to be the playback of this device set to default. I plug my headphones in and then I would go and hit record. And you'll have to trust me on this. As I, I guess I could plug the speakers in, but I'd run the risk of feedback with that because it would be picking up the mic, and yeah, we don't want to do that. So as I hit record, I can hear me, and I can go and alter what I'm hearing. Turn one way, I mainly hear the microphone. Turn the other way, I can mainly hear the output. So I can go back and forth between these two. And when I'm done, then I have a mix of those two things recorded. The uh, mic thing I was talking about, it's not the uh, arrow. It's the uh, bar right there under the stop button. That bar that ah, okay. monitors the input. There's the input. Button. You input the right. Volume or the All right. Or whatever. Excellent. Um, probably where I had my mic level uh, through that. <coughs> Let's see as I go across. Yeah, probably, probably, probably where I had the mic level um, would do that. Or I was just talking quieter or whatever. Yeah. All right. So now I'm going to go switch this back, <coughs> switch the audio back to the speaker so that we can hear the two things together. And I go and talk. I can see based on the level where I'm at. All right. I can move. What I'm hearing. You can turn the bottom, the bottom line with the right. plus and the minus. Yeah, that's or what I can move it up. That's what we're going to do next. Butting against the top. Quite. So I can go back and forth. Now, notice that there's actually, actually, I'm not exactly sure why we have a difference in volume. I don't recall what all I was fiddling with at the time. But that's actually good because, as was mentioned. This is almost like balancing your picture, right? 
The one picture that uh, we did, uh, uh, that, that uh, you did with Hello Kitty, was too bright, so you had to darken a little bit so it matched the tone of the other one. Well, here, and let's say you were, you were splicing together two sound clips, one of which was, and even if they weren't at the same time, but you wanted to make them approximately the same volume. And one person you had spoke really loud, one person you're very shy and spoke really quiet. What you can do is individual tracks you can either boost or diminish. So I will go and boost this one a little bit, and I'll diminish that one a little bit. And now when I play them, should be more balanced. And I go and talk. I can hear me. And I can go and alter what I'm hearing. Turn one way, I mainly hear the microphone. Or I can move it up. Turn the other way, I can mainly hear so the So I can microphone. play until I get the sweet spot so I can that I back want. And forth between these two. All right. So I can adjust the relative volumes to, to get that. Now, one of the assignments that you have, the podcast assignment, you need to take a couple of sound clips that I have, all right? And why did I do that? Well, I, I want you to learn how to import it. And it's actually not that hard to go and import this stuff. But more important than that, I wanted you to, be, to have to go in and balance the audio. In other words, it's very unlikely that your recorded voice will be just at the same volume as mine, and therefore you'll need to fiddle with this. One thing that you can do as you're playing with this is you can either mute where you only hear the one track. There, I'm not hearing that track. Or I can click solo and mute everything else. Or I can move it up in which case and only show that one. All right, so mute turns it off, solo turns everything else off and turns it on. So that's good if you're if you're if you want to listen to just one thing at a time. Yes. Now, once you've got that adjusted to where it it sounds it sounds balanced the way you want it to sound, how do you save that? Well, when you when you save the project, it will save that settings as well. It'll, it'll save those yeah. levels. It saves every track, every setting, all right. your settings, your left and right, your plus right. and minus. Because keep in mind, the way you set those things is specific to this audio recording. That's not like something you're going to want on the next audio recording. Next audio recording, you're going to want to fiddle and get your own settings. For. So once I save that, and I come back to, and play it, right? It's not going to display. It's going to display. All those settings, Correct. zero. No. Well, no, it'll no. Still be where you left. Still be where you left off. Where you left it off. Yeah, it'll be w if you went and recorded something else. Okay, now if I exported that to MP3, yes, then re-imported it. It would then all those settings yes. be yeah, zero. Yeah, combined. It'll it'll do like a combination of it. It'll probably export it like a wave, and then you'd have to return it to an MP3 or something. Right. Like that. It, uh, uh, in other words, this is just like images. This is where there's all these parallels with this. When we record these tracks, all right, we can record, I don't know if there's a limit, but we can record a bunch of tracks, all right? When it's saved in the Audacity format, the integrity of each of those tracks stays. In other words, each track remains a separate, differentiated track. When you go and export it then, it gets mixed down into the two stereo tracks, the left and right. So if you re-imported it then, you'd only get the one track, left and right. And you'd lose the ability to adjust, to adjust it on that. So the lesson is, what you do is you would export it to make it public, to put it out on your website as a podcast or whatever. But if, if you thought that you might want to go back and manipulate it, you'd also keep the audacity. And again, that's really about the same as the um, images. You know, if I wanted to put my blinking koala on the website, I'd, I'd put the GIF file out there. If, however, I thought that, gee, in addition to, to winking, I'm going to want him to wiggle his ears or something, I would need to keep the, <laughs> I would need to keep the, uh, the, the, the GIF file so I could go back in and have the integrity of the, uh, of the, uh, individual layers. So let's show what happens when we go and 